maybe we have some sort of predisposed talents and some people are like more extrovert than others or some people are more creative than others but I think you need so many skills to be an entrepreneur that there's no baby that just comes out being like yeah I'm, I'm completely ready for that. Hey there and welcome to the Tribe of Leaders podcast. I'm your host Emmy Kirshner. I'm a serial entrepreneur, investor, and business coach for ambitious women who are boldly taking their business to the next level. And I believe that building a successful business isn't about working 24-7 just to merely meet a revenue goal. What it does take is a unique blend of dedication to purpose, courageous action, and frequently sheer will to overcome the odds that lead to meaningful impact and experiencing a life well lived. In each episode, you'll get to know the women and men who are unafraid to put it all on the line as they share the stories of success and failure that have made them incredible leaders and the magic they gift the world with. As you're listening, and I hope finding value, don't forget to share the Tribe of Leaders podcast with all of your other entrepreneurial friends and to follow us wherever you're listening to this podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Tribe of Leaders podcast. Today, I am, as always, super excited to have my guest, Corey Jones. Corey is the founder of Untapped, an award-winning London-based social media agency for ambitious brands. They have worked with clients like Virgin Startup, Nat West, and Omaze on social strategy, content, and advertising. Corey, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Yeah. So let's dive in. We just were having a, a nice little chat and would love to hear your backstory a little bit. You know, you were in the corporate world nine to five and left. Why? What happened? Disenfranchised. Yeah. Disenfranchised is a good word for it. So I was working in higher education, working at universities, managing their social media content. And it was kind of a situation where I think they sort of looked around the room and thought, okay, she is the youngest person on the team. Let's have her manage social media. But there wasn't necessarily the structure or set up for, there wasn't really the belief in social media making an impact for the university. And it was very very slow moving organizations with a lot of different stakeholders where you have to get sign off for various campaigns and social media is the complete opposite of that if something is trending you need to post it that day if you post it three days later when 10 different people have signed off it's no longer cool it's actually just makes you look a bit behind the times and so I was constantly gracing up against wanting to do things differently and be very reactive and um, push the boundaries more of what had been done before and there just was wasn't that kind of structure in place at at the universities that I was working at. And I think a lot of the people I speak to that work in corporate organizations that are very, very large, they have that same thing where they're working in such a reactive space, but it's not, not reflected through the company. So I started freelancing initially. I had a couple of different tech startups approach and asked, would I manage their social media? And because I still had my nine to five job, I just thought this would be a really fun thing to do on the weekends. And when they said, how much do you charge? <laughs> I was like, oh, 10 pounds an hour, which is like nothing. And, and it was very, you know, we didn't even really have contracts in place. It was very just casual. And a but it gave me proof of concept that there are startups out there and there are organizations that would pay for me to manage their social media. So that sort of gave me the confidence too when I really got to the point where I desperately wanted to not be in my nine to five. I thought, okay, maybe I could make this part-time thing the full-time thing. And that was kind of the origins of it. That's amazing. And I love that because I had a client who years ago, she was she's still a graphic designer, but she started freelancing. We worked together and she now has her branding agency and just skyrocketed, which is so fun for me to watch. And I love that you just, you didn't stop yourself with, oh, I need to have like this whole plan, which is where my brain usually goes to. Like, I need to have it all organized. <laughs> so I love well, I Yeah, I feel like I could have definitely had more of a plan in place now that I look back. But I don't know, I I was speaking to someone the other day about this, actually one of our clients who is a very successful entrepreneur. And she was saying to me that if you had it all planned out and if you knew how hard it all was, do you think you still would have done it? And I was saying, no, I think actually the naivety was a really good thing because 
I did just jump in and I remember saying to my colleagues, I was like, well, it's not forever. If it doesn't work out, then I'll get another job and I'll say, you know, I went traveling for a year or something. And I just sort of approached it like that, that it didn't need to be a big, scary thing. Although now I think if I knew everything that it entails, I probably would be way more scared to to start out with it. Right. I think, but that's, I think the way a lot of entrepreneurs start is, particularly from a freelance perspective, like, let me just get my feet wet and this is fun. And if it doesn't work, then that's okay. And then yeah, not necessarily overnight, but like things just ex- expand and it's one thing after another. So kind of falling forward is, is a really good thing. Did you feel like, and I want to circle back into working at the university that if they had structured things differently, they could have moved more quickly and made decisions differently? Or do you feel like that's some of the challenges of having essentially a much larger organization? I think it's a big challenge when you've got larger teams. There were, you know, 60, 70 people just in my marketing department. It's a challenge as well when you're working in a legacy organization where things have been done a certain way for years previously. And also if you've got a lot of people in place who have worked at that organization for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, they can remember things from a while ago that, you know, if they're very different to the things you're suggesting, I think that is difficult. Um, There's definitely companies that do a good job of thinking and acting like startups, but on a larger scale. And I think from what we've seen, the people we've worked with, it tends to come from the trust that managers have with, with the people in the team and actually less of a kind of hierarchical structure where Um, the junior people aren't really trusted with their ideas. I think if that's flipped as more of a, you know, everyone is here to contribute and everyone has great things to say, I think that's where it can work a lot better. Okay. And how has that impacted how you've created your agency? Freedom, flexibility, I think, that we give to the team is a massive kind of contrast to what I had when I was working nine to five. So Even things like, you know, COVID massively accelerated this, but even before that, the flexibility to work from home if you want to a couple of days a week or to not make people feel really bad if they've got a doctor's appointment and they need to take, you know, an hour out of the day for it. And that trust of knowing that if the work gets done and if everyone actually enjoys turning up to work, then it's going to be just a much better environment generally. I think there's no sense in making people really miserable and then oh sorry one sec um there's no sense in making people really miserable at their job and then expecting really good output still it's just it won't happen right right I feel like the more fun that we can have in our work and the more trust that we have the less it becomes work and it becomes the, the way we're contributing to something whether it's society or just contributing to like the overall functioning of the organization would you agree with that or yeah I would definitely agree and I think thinking about what you're contributing is such a key part of what you just said that if you actually feel like you are making a difference to the team that you're in and that is really valued it's huge compared to if you just feel like you turn up every day and actually you're there to fill a seat but there's not actually much accountability that's that's happening so yeah fun is a massive part of it we were hiring for a new team member the other day and our they they asked was someone in the interview asked what's it like to work here and I was like well I'm biased so I'll let the other people on the panel in the team answer this one and our video editor was like it doesn't really feel like work because I just sit every day and edit videos which you know working in a social media agency there's always going to be lots of fun jobs which are maybe more fun than you would get in some other places but that just really made me think like oh yeah what a good job because you just turn up and you do what you love every day and Thank God there are people who love editing videos. <laughs> I know. I do not. <laughs> I <open> my eyes <laughs> out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, completely. <laughs> like, that's what I love too, is that, that different people love doing different things. And when you have all the right people in the right seats, like they're excited. They're happy. 
Yeah. And I think that's something that when I kind of started freelancing and taking on those clients, when, you know, where we're talking about when I sort of jumped from the nine to five is that's just something that I didn't realize. I would really beat myself up for not loving every single aspect of running a business. I'd be like, why don't you get really involved in the finance? And why does the admin make you really bored? And, but then you actually realize that that's just not, you can't have every skill set. It's impossible to be all things to all people and actually if you read a job description saying you need to be able to strategically run a company and have the vision you need to be able to be HR and admin and finance and the creative and marketing and all the stuff that you have to do as a freelancer you'd never take that job because you'd you'd see it was so unrealistic yet when it's our own thing we really put that upon ourselves Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. And one of the things I teach is do something for a while so you know how to do it and how it works and then delegate it Mm. as quickly as possible to somebody who's far better suited to take on that task or, yeah, absolutely. What do you feel like, well, let me ask you this too. When did you, or did you make the decision to go from freelance to, oh, I'm like cemented in growing this organization? So it was probably around two years into freelancing and it had got to a stage where it was very busy, where I was trying to work on the business to grow it and think about future clients and think about our own marketing. But I was also working in the business on so many aspects of client delivery. And we started working with a couple of freelancers. So even though I was a freelancer, I would then delegate to other freelancers and I just started to realize that no one has the same passion for this as you, especially if they're not bought in as, you know, a full payroll employee. So that probably was the sort of conscious decision to actually hire our first staff member and the second one and et cetera, when I felt like I want this to be a brand that's beyond me and that could potentially be you know, managed by other people one day or, or have more of a future than if when you're just freelancing, I think it can feel very much like if I'm not here, then what is this? <laughs> right. Yeah. And how long did it take you to go from like freelancing just on the weekends to when you left your corporate job? It was about a year and a half and I had three part-time clients over that time and two of them that I knew would be there to go to when I left the nine to five. And that was, it was nowhere near the same money that I'd made at the nine to five. It was far, far lower, but I felt like, okay, at least I've got two people and I'll just work to, to try and get more of them. Yeah. Is there one thing that you've learned that you feel like every entrepreneur should know or can learn in the time that you've been running the agency? I would say don't overestimate what you can get done in the space of a year. Think longer term than that because quite often we set ourselves these really, really big goals for the year, but then don't actually track that back to the activity and the habits that you need to build every single day to reach that goal. So it's all very well saying, okay, I want to make a hundred thousand this year. But if you're not then every day sending out messages to potential clients or posting to social to put yourself out there or all those things that will get you to that goal, you'll get to December and just feel like you set a massive goal that's completely unreachable. And then you'll feel really on the back burner and disappointed that that it didn't happen. So setting realistic goals, but then actually building the habits to get to those goals definitely would be advice that I wish someone would have told me five, six years ago. Yeah. I'm so glad you're saying that too, because that's exactly what I do with my clients is one I refer to as the throw up goal. So it's that that Mm. yearly goal that makes you really uncomfortable. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, because we generally stop like taking action, like we get close enough to it and then we don't do like the next step. So I like to get a little bit beyond what they're comfortable with. And then what do we need to do today? Right. Like, like all the planners and, you know, a lot of strategy is great. But how are you going to, what are you going to do today? How are you going to get there tomorrow and be consistent with it? So I'm so glad that you're saying that. And <laughs> yeah, I completely uh, agree. Echo your approach. Yeah. So when you're thinking about your, like the yearly goals, do you have a process or parameters that you kind of walk through? 
Yeah, so our main yearly goal tends to always be financial and I'll look at um, firstly what would our estimated costs be for that year, what profit would we want to have left over, what kind of money would we want to take out of the business and then I'll, I'll know, okay, we need to make this much per year before we even get to the stage of making money. So that the last couple of years has been a big shift in in setting that goal and thinking about how we reach it because when I was freelancing it was very much more just would anyone give me money this month for a project that'd be great right. and, you know, you'd be just happy with whatever and then you actually think and I, I think it was hiring people and having an office and having all those extra expenses that, that makes you flip it to think actually what am I spending and then what's the profit on top because when you're freelance it's very easy to think well I don't have any expenses it's just me it's just my laptop and it doesn't drive you necessarily to know, okay, if we don't make 10, 20 K this month, we're not breaking even or whatever that number is to you. So that tends to be how we think about the financial one. And then I'll tend to look back at what was difficult or stressful the previous year and see if we can make a goal around that. So if, for example, we had some great client projects, but we felt like you know, we just sunk our teeth into them and then, but it was a three month contract or something. I'll think, okay, well, can one of our goals be that we actually just have six to 12 month contracts in place so that we can build up that relationship with the client and actually kind of see them through to a year's worth of results rather than just working on a campaign basis or, Mm -hmm. or, you know, or if I felt like I was too much of a bottleneck and I had too much on, like, where can we delegate or who else can we hire or things like that. So I'll, I'll tend to look at it both sort of forward for revenue but then also backwards on like what what would I change and what could we do differently for this year I love that and I like looking at I haven't thought about this particularly or in the same way I love that you're looking at like what stressed us out last year mm, yeah I, th- I think it's so important to do because it's very easy to in January get really caught up in like this year is going to be amazing and, and not actually think okay based on last year like what did we learn so like one of my major learnings last year was I had a bit of a health scare in um, June and July and ended up in hospital for like a month and I was like if that happened again we need way better processes for how everything works without me being here because I do all the sales and the business development so if that's just down to me and it's not being sort of automated or managed by other people at least to some degree it it becomes very very difficult so things like that like looking back on it and then seeing how can we take that forward to next year yeah I like that because I do really what didn't work I mean it's a similar process but I like the like what stressed me out just so it gives you some different information and different things to kind of measure yeah I'm curious too as you're moving through your journey as an entrepreneur, as a leader, do you feel like entrepreneurs are born or made? It's such a great question. And I've actually gone back and forth on this quite a bit in my own mind, but I think made, like, I think, well, I had this great quote on this actually from someone who was saying like, I wasn't born an entrepreneur, I was born a baby. And you know, the person who's like the best (laughs) artist in the world, they were still born a baby. Like everyone, maybe we have some sort of predisposed talents and some people are like more extrovert than others or some people are more creative than others. But I think you need so many skills to be an entrepreneur that there's no baby that just comes out being like, yeah, I'm, I'm completely ready for that. So I think it is also much more empowering to think of entrepreneurs as being made because if you just think of it as being born, then actually it excludes a whole number of people who I think would make fantastic entrepreneurs. But And sometimes, you know, life deals you the cards that give you more resilience, which is a really helpful skill for being an entrepreneur. So yeah, made definitely. But I think it's such a great discussion, actually, a very interesting one. Yeah, I agree. Because until you just started sharing, like I would have gone, maybe not towards born, but like there's people who tend to naturally gravitate towards that because of Mm -hmm. certain characteristics. But there's so much learning you have to do to be successful that... And so much, I think, getting out of your own way that um, it's definitely a maid as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's shift gears a little bit, if you don't mind. I'd love to to dive into like how you help your clients and the social media, all of it, advertising, all of all of the magic that you make for your people. And who are the companies that you tend to work with and what are they struggling with? 
So we tend to come across people who do not have the time, the knowledge or the inclination really to manage social media themselves. It's obviously a very fast moving method of communication, although we're biased, but we think it is like the most important marketing tactic that you can be using in you know 2022 and it's difficult for for companies to constantly be staying up to date with algorithm changes or reels coming out or videos you know being ever more important and it often falls to just one person in an organization to be the social media manager and actually being a social media manager you do have to be a data analyst a strategist a copywriter a videographer there's so many different skill sets that go into that so when we work with people they've recognized that it's very very hard for them to keep up with social media themselves and they'd actually would rather just have an agency that can provide a videographer a strategist a data person etc as different individuals where everyone's got their skill set that they're really known for and, and you know that they love working on and bring all of that to the team so um yeah we work with small and large companies through from um tech scale-ups uh, subscription businesses and larger corporates like natwest or kawasaki um, we've got a couple of different packages where we can work with people one-off on like a strategy or a training session. But the bulk of our work is monthly content creation and advertising where, again, people realize they don't want to manage it themselves. They'd rather work with experts that they can outsource to and, and that we can help people to get more attention, more customers, more revenue through their social marketing. And I mean, we were talking about this before we started recording where I shared like social media is one of the things that I like doing least and I'm bringing on <laughs> yeah. uh, my marketing team and a new level to have them take care of 90% of it. Um, <laughs> I presume I'm not the only, uh, the only one that feels that way. And why do people hold on to like, Oh, I've got to do the social media myself for, I think far too long. Cause I should have delegated you know, a while ago. Yeah, I think sometimes people feel like just because anyone can technically start a Facebook or Instagram account, they feel like they could manage it professionally. Whereas with things like Google AdWords or, you know, kind of marketing mediums where not as many people would log on and have a go themselves. I think people hold on to it thinking um, that they, they can do it. I think people also find quite a sort of personal attachment to it sometimes. And then I think mainly probably it's a kind of fear of investing in it that people feel like it should be free to do social media, but actually don't realize that social media takes up so much time and time is the most valuable resource that, that you have if you're an entrepreneur. So yes, you might be investing money by having someone else manage your social media, but actually you're freeing yourself up from time, which is way mm -hmm. more important. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. And you're going to get better results than somebody trying to manage their social media themselves. So without divulging your secrets, um, <laughs> what does that look like for some of your clients? Like, How can you help them achieve better results results and sell more through social? Because it's, if I'm remembering correctly, we only, the algorithm only shows your posts like 2% of, to 2% of your audience or something. Like it's really small. Yeah, it is tiny. To do really well on social media organically, I would, say, I would say, without divulging secrets, but some sort of key things to think about is the mix of using data, but also using psychology to get to know your audience better. So I think a lot of people jump onto social and they post what they would like to be saying and they ignore what their audience might actually like to hear from them. We do a lot of work to get to know a brand's audience, both looking at data and numbers that we can get online and through various different tools and, and through you know the channels themselves and analyzing that brand's current audience to find out who these people are in a numbers way. But then also going beyond that to look more at the kind of psychographics you would call them so demographics would be like age location where do they work psychographics is, is much more what you actually need to know for producing really good social media content and those are the small nuggets like this audience loves you know dogs and then they also love going on holiday in Cornwall because that's great for dogs or you know things that like link up together that you want to get to the point where you know that if you post something to social it's a topic that people love. You've presented it in a way that your audience is going to share and engage it, engage with it. And 
that needs to be at a more psychological level, getting to know your audience and listening to them. And so I'd say that's what we spend a lot of time doing for our clients. And that's where we kind of see the biggest results when you've really got to know what it is that makes the audience engage and buy versus making them just not be interested. Got it. And I'm curious, do you have a favorite social media platform right now? Or my personal favorite is Instagram, I would say, because I kind of feel like it's a little bit of each of them that you can get quite a lot from it in terms of growth and finding good people to connect with. Professionally, though, I think LinkedIn is so unrivaled for generating leads. And actually, probably a lot of business owners do what I've just said, and they'll go for Instagram because they like it personally and it's a very kind of maybe egocentric channel where you can get good vanity metrics but actually if you're thinking in terms of generating leads and what is useful for your business then posting content to LinkedIn and reaching out to people on LinkedIn is the best way to go so a mix of them (laughs) (laughs) well it's kind of my my personal and professional as well and I love playing with the ads on Instagram and just seeing how quickly the algorithm will like fill my feed with with different things so. yeah I know it's creepy sometimes isn't it it's very <laughs> like if you're speaking to a friend about something and then the next second you go on Instagram and you've got ads for it and you're like great <laughs> data privacy yeah. working well yeah exactly or where they show up in other places too um, yeah I put down one Instagram ad and in this kind of ongoing cycle and then I was on and I was on my phone and then I saw the same ad on a McKinsey website Uh, that's crazy yeah (laughs) yeah they're always listening (laughs) which is kind of it's scary in some senses and actually there's been so many netflix documentaries recently about all of the bad elements of data and everything with social and i'll always watch it again i'll watch it personally and be like gosh that is terrible and then professionally i'm like it's so helpful for brands that you can get in front of exactly the people you want to get in front of so yeah yeah, i'm a bit split on on the morals of that really yeah because it is a little scary and it's so cool the information that you can yeah you can kind of tailor and and connect with the right people in a better way oh yeah completely and it, it just it makes me so annoyed then when I see other forms of marketing that just so aren't targeted or trackable like I got a leaflet through the door once for a restaurant which was advertising gluten-free pizzas and it was a restaurant really far away from my house and I was thinking for the amount that you've paid to get all these leaflets printed to pay someone to put all these leaflets through the door you could have just put a Facebook ad out and you could have targeted people who like pizza and eat gluten-free and are within a two kilometer radius of the restaurant and the results would have been way better than just a very scattergun uh, leafleting approach so yeah. it definitely has advantages all of the targeting that you can do yeah absolutely absolutely Corey this has been so much fun and I know you have a really cool invitation for somebody who might want to get social media off their plate so can you share what that is with everybody yeah sure so for anyone listening who wants to chat more about what they should be posting to social media or if they should start an ads campaign or is generally interested in outsourcing their social media then I'm very happy to have a free 20 minute consultation with me where we can chat on video about what's happening for your company currently with social media and what you could be doing to make it a lot easier for you from a time point of view, but also a lot more successful with the results that you could get. Yeah, which I love. And thank you so much for offering that because as I said, as I'm offloading more and more of that for my, with my marketing team, like the time that I'm going to get back, not just the hours of like actually doing the stuff, but the thinking about it is yeah completely (laughs) yeah and that's often actually what takes more time is if it's a task that really drains you and you don't enjoy it's all that time you spend procrastinating on it and beating yourself up that oh I should have done it by now so yeah completely I feel you there yeah so I'm looking forward that's going to be the biggest thing for me is like the energy that I can think about I don't know solving other problems completely yeah absolutely Corey where can everybody connect with you too Where's the best place to find you? So you can find me on Instagram at Corey F. Jones, or if you search for Corey Jones on LinkedIn as well, then I'll pop up. And our website, if you want to find out more about the agency, is www.untappeddigital.co. 
Okay, cool. Is there a story behind how you named the agency too? One of my old flatmates came up with it, I think. I'll give her credit here. I think we're having a kind of idea session, but it, it, the origin is basically that there's so much untapped potential on social media and so, so much endless potential for brands that aren't doing enough with digital yet. But the idea is that, you know, we can help you tap into that and, and help sort of unleash this um, limitless potential that you can have with social. So, yeah, that is where the brand name came from. And for eight is actually from going freelance to start an agency I was so hung up on what will the brand be and how should this sound and how should this look and that would be another lesson definitely to, to just sort of get on with that I think a lot more because you can get very hung up on like oh well I can't start on that yet because we don't have a name and things that actually sometimes you just need to pick something and then get going well I love untapped it really resonated with me and oh, me feel like oh you can solve all these problems that like I haven't figured it out yet even like anticipating <laughs> all of the the different ways that you can make magic with uh with everybody so oh, um, good well I'm glad to hear that it resonated yeah, absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much for being on. We have to wrap up, which is, time's gone by so quickly. <laughs> and I really I loved um, having our conversation. Thank you so much for having me. It was so lovely. Awesome. And for everybody who's listening, we will see you next week. Thank you so much for being a listener of the Tribe of Leaders podcast. I am so grateful for each and every episode that you tune in and listen to. And I hope that you get a ton of value that you can implement starting today. I do have just a quick favor. If you wouldn't mind hopping on to wherever it is that you listen to podcasts and leave us a rating and review, it would help us tremendously so that the Tribe of Leaders podcast can be found more easily and help inspire other entrepreneurial leaders.